uh, welcome everyone to Nesto's first Instagram Live. Uh, today, Kath and I will talk about uh, the real estate market, interest rates, uh, trends, how people are feeling, uh, and most importantly, whether our, our advice leads towards fixed or variable uh, in, this, in this market. Uh, so joining us today for the Realtors Perspective it is, is Kathleen Abel of um, Keller Williams Distinct, Distinction, and she works mostly in the Udaway region uh, and surrounding area in Quebec. So hello, Thank Kathleen. You. Thanks for joining. <laughs> Excited to be here. Thank you so much. All right. I'm going to start off with the, the first question, and um, it's more of a feeling question. So a lot of people are watching the housing market. They believe it's cooling. They think it's cooling. Not all of them are experiencing it, that cooling aspect, depending on where they are in Canada, but specific to you and your markets. Um, what's changed for your customers as the interest rates started increasing since last March? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, like you mentioned, Bank of Canada have been increasing interest rates to be able to cool down the real estate market a little bit, right? So we have seen a, a cool down um, in the Utah region. We have much less multiple offers, so uh, and properties are staying on the market for a longer period of time. Uh, so they would stay on the market for maybe you know a few days, and now we're back up to about uh, between. In 30 days, uh, so it's still good. Uh, it's not bad. <laughs> it's just that I guess it changed a little bit with interest rates going up. People's ability to buy, you know, the prices are a little bit lower, and I think there's a lot of uncertainty around around the real estate market as well. I, I like that you said it's still good because it, it does feel good. Like when I was looking at homes two years ago in the height of the pandemic, it, it was a scary, unpredictable. It was not a fun experience, and that's not how you imagine buying a home being. No. One. Fun, you want it to be enjoyable and rewarding. I find now we're seeing um, more financing conditions in the offers, which I love seeing that because it protects the borrower. Uh, and I guess the question I'm trying, to, trying, trying to, to ask you is, is it a safer time to buy a home now as a buyer than it was three, four months ago? Or is it a scarier time? Hmm. Um, so I would definitely say, I mean, safer. In Quebec, it's a little bit different because we have a lot of rules and regulations around inspection clauses and financing clauses. So we did see a lot of people removing financing clauses or even reviewing, you know, condo board documents whenever buying a condo. And so, um, yeah, it was a risk to take, right? And people were willing to take that risk to get their dream home uh, and have a, a bit of a, a better offer than others because we were seeing multiple offers. So... Now I think the stress is a little bit, in, you know, reversed where we're seeing sellers being a little bit more stressed, feeling like maybe they kind of miss the boat if ever they've been waiting to sell. Uh, and then we're seeing buyers that, you know, are taking a bit more time, uh, are able to visit a house more than once mm -hmm. <laughs> in a long time, mm -hmm. um, including inspections, including, uh, you know, the review of, of, of condo board documents. So. Uh, I think I think that it, it will be safer and it's going to be, you know, it's 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 starting to be a little bit more uh, of an enjoyable experience for buyers. Best case. Um, on the subject of cooling market or heating market, one indication or one indicator that we like to follow at Nesto is the median down payment that the users are, are anticipating using toward the purchase. And at the height of the pandemic, when the market was, quote unquote, crazy hot, um, and I, I would almost call it unsafe or unfair for a buyer in, in some aspects, we noticed the down payment increased tremendously. A lot of times the borrowers were, were doing everything they could to get 20% down payment to mitigate the obstacles of potential uh, inspection or financing or, or, or appraisal issues. Now we're seeing that median down payment drop tremendously as well across the country. And so I think, you know, economist data might come out in a few months and, and, and tell us what that means, but based on our experience in the industry, do you believe that's a very strong indicator of, of a cooling market or we're actually in a, in a buyer's market now? Mm. Tough question. <laughs> sure. um, I mean, the switch comes really quickly, right? Uh, and uh, I haven't been in the industry for 30 years, but, you know, working with people that have, they all say the same thing. It's, it's and Gary Keller, you know, who's the founder of, of Keller Williams actually spoke about this as well, but the switch between, a seller's market and a buyer's market is all all the like is almost one day to the next and so we were seeing that uh, if you're if you're <laughs> in the past three years where we've been seeing a seller's market it was pretty clear right uh, and now we're getting more into a buyer's market where buyers have a bit more flexibility they can negotiate a little bit on conditions on price point like we touched about and so I think that we're switching. We, we've switched. It's been about a month and a half, two months now that we've been switching to uh, a seller's market, a buyer's market for sure. Still a great 
market for sellers though. I mean, house prices are still high um, and it's a balance thing. I think we spoke about this a little bit, but in a few of our conversations, but you know, it's, it's always time to sell. It's always time to buy. Like if it's a need, right. For a lot of people. And so if you sell high, you're going to buy high, but if you sell a little bit lower, then you're going to buy a little bit lower too. So it's also a, a balance game. Yes. So timing is everything. Um, I, I, I do want to jump into how interest rates have impacted our customers strictly on the mortgage front in, in a second, but one more question going back to the, the home buying uh, experience. When you had, I'm imagining you had a subset of customers who, who needed to buy, whether it was a cottage for leisure luxury or they needed to buy a house they didn't want to miss the boat. Hmm. Um, has their feelings changed or has their strategy changed with these new rates? Is that need still there or are, are they less opportunistic? The need to buy, you mean, or the need to sell? The, the need to buy. Everyone wanted to get in, they didn't want to miss the boat. Yeah. The people who didn't get in but were, 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 were so eager to and were doing it from the power to, what do you think they're doing today? Um, I think because, and again, we spoke about this a little bit, but uncertainty is, is, part of, is part of what we're seeing right now with a lot of people, right? Sellers and buyers. Mm -hmm. And so um, a lot of investors that are long-term, you know, and people that have bought quite a few houses, it's like you said, it's kind of, it's a timing game, but at the end of the day, it's balanced. So I'm seeing a lot of people that, you know, there's, they've been wanting to buy, they're still going to buy, people are excited. Um, they might feel a little bit less stressed that it's not as much of a, of a seller's market. So they're not feeling like they're going to jump into this taking risks that they probably take. Um, so we're still seeing people buying and investors are still buying. And, you know, for them, it's kind of, it's even better than it was, uh, you know, a year ago, two years ago. Um, a lot of them are keeping homes long-term as well. So that's the difference. But uh, I'm, I'm, not seeing a big difference in people's, you know, people's uh, want to, to purchase a property. That's a good optimistic view. I, I share it with you. I think it's the same on our side too. When it comes to strictly to the mortgage transactions, what we're noticing is now that the rates are higher, um, mm -hmm. that goes into whether or not I should, I, should, I should do something with my mortgage. So if you exclude the purchases and we have left refinances and mortgage renewals, um, with the rates being where they are, the refinance business that we're seeing or the, the requests we're seeing, are a lot more um, strategic and less opportunistic. So previously, uh, when rates were really low, a refinance would take place to you know, uh, build a, a school fund for the children or to buy a cottage or to enhance lifestyle, uh, enhance luxury within the lifestyle. There was a lot of reasons why one would, would refinance, uh, including investments. Today, the, the, the refinance requests that we're predominantly getting are, are more so um, cash flow, um, Based, so they want, they want to make sure they have as much money available to them per month as possible, which includes extending amortization um, or lumping in their existing debts into their mortgage at the lower rate. So we're seeing a lot of people at this moment in time um, set themselves up with a buffer for the future, the unpredictable future, and a lot less people refinancing for a boat or refinancing for investment purposes. So I, I think the refinance transactions are going to come down a little bit, and the remaining one would be renewals. And it's, it's interesting, the renewal piece here, because we've had such a hot market since, 20, since 2016 or so, but 2017, 2018, 2019, there was so much real estate activity and purchase activity. Those mortgages are going to be coming due for term for maturity, 2022, 23, 24. So I, I feel like the renewal market will be just as, as hot as it previously was. And the thing that was less critical for me is the purchases. But based on our conversation here, it sounds like we can expect purchases to remain stable. I, I don't see any indication in this conversation has not yielded any indication that there's a major fear of a housing crash in our day-to-day -day customers. Now, if you read the news, there's a lot more fear being spread there, but in our day-to-day, -day, I think we're on the same page. Yeah, it's going to be, um, and you know, you touching a, a good point where, yeah, you're going to have a lot of refinances for, um, you know, paying debts and, and yes, life is getting much more expensive, right? <laughs> we have, a lot of expenses in general. So with the inflation, there's this whole, there's a lot of people that are getting a little bit worried about, uh, about that. And we've seen, you know, the stock market go down quite a bit. So um, it's, it's, but at the end of the day, uh, and uh, this is my region, right? Like our region in Utah and Ottawa and in Gatineau, in Gatineau, because our prices are quite, they're much lower than in Ottawa. 
I mean, there's reasons for that, right? For tax oh, difference. That might be one. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's reasons for that. But at the end of the day, I think that if people want to become homeowners, most of my clientele comes from Toronto, Montreal, uh, Ottawa, right? Because they can come here, they can buy a home, uh, and they can actually afford to become home homeowners. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, seeing, I'm not seeing a decrease in people wanting to buy. I'm seeing an increase in listings, so people selling, um, and which is which is getting back to what it was prior to COVID, basically. Got right? it. Um, so it's it's going to be interesting to see what how things are going to go. But I really doubt in our region we're going to feel uh, a huge impact in terms of uh, a really big decrease in prices. You got it. Well, one one thing I, I actually forgot to mention when I was talking about the refinances, and I, I think it's just important to make sure everyone that's listening gets to, to, to hear this in case someone in their life or their circles could, could, could use the advice. But when we're in an area in an environment like this, when rates are increasing and inflation is, is it is what it is, and the cost of living is increasing as well. Um, there's a lot of borrowers who, who, who use credit a lot, and there's also a lot of borrowers out there who are almost paycheck to paycheck, or even paycheck to paycheck. If, if you are one of them, or if you know one of them, it's really important that you take advantage of the opportunity to protect yourself from a life event or a, a, an expense that's actually gonna put you in a position where you cannot um, repair your situation with the refinance. So I'll give you an example. To get the best refinance rate today at Nesto, you'll need a credit score of 680. If you get your credit checked by your bank or Nesto, and your score is 690, and your credit balances, are, they're not maxed, but they're high, and you're almost paycheck to paycheck, there's a good chance that the next time you get your credit checked, your score will be below 680, and you would have lost that opportunity to refinance today and pay off that debt at the best rate available to the perfect credit score of 680 or higher. So. The reason I'm sharing this is because we see it a lot. You, you, you entertain the idea of improving your cash flow or paying off your debt. You, you start the process and then you procrastinate. Mm -hmm. If these people who's almost paycheck to paycheck, the procrastinating could, could, could be extremely detrimental to actually what is available to you to get you out of that, that, that hole you're in or you, you might fall into shortly. So I think that was just important to get off my chest because it, it means a lot to me to, to, to be able to save someone while they're in the best position possible to be saved. Whereas after the fact, it's so much more difficult to get a very competitive rate product or even a great experience. Um, I've talked about a lot and I, you know, talking with clients and people that are getting ready to buy their first property or even buying investment property. Um, not a lot of people are educated about it, right? And they don't understand what actually brings their credit down and what brings their credit up. And so, uh, you know, this is just a little tidbit, but when you use credit, it's not just paying on time that makes a difference, right? Uh, you, could pay your, you could pay your bills, you know, 100% of the time, zero, zero out your credit card every single month, uh, but your credit score would still go down if you use your entire credit, right? So if you have $1,000 of credit and you use $1,000 every month, the banks or the, the institutions will see that as you utilizing 100% of your, your credit, right? So typically to be able to keep your credit score um, at the same or lower or actually make it higher, you'd want your credit to be used, to be utilized less than 30% every single month. Exactly. And that makes a huge difference for a lot of people because they don't notice or they don't know. And after a whole year of, you know, if they decide to not necessarily refinance to help consolidate debt, for example, they could end up losing, you know, 100 points. So they, like you said, they could end up having a good credit and then being at a point where they can't actually buy anything or they have to go to a B lender where interest rates are much higher um, and are, are much higher, right? So uh, it's a good point to talk about that. And I think people should look into it more. Uh, and be aware, and I know a lot of banks are starting to offer offer that as well. Live should be just on credit, because I think we can talk about that for, for about an hour. Um, but I'm, I'm glad, glad you brought it up. And just to, to close on the credit subject, you know, paying your bills on schedule is the expectation. That's not mm -hmm. how you pay credit. No. Um, and you know, we don't know the date that your bank reports your balance to the credit bureau. So to have your balance as close to zero as possible at all times is the best way to make sure you're going to get as close to a score of 800 or 900. Um, as you could. Um, so the, the big question that, that we're supposed to talk about, and uh, we kind of alluded to it so far, is fixed versus variable. I, I have a very strong and potentially biased opinion on, on the subject, so I'd love to start with you talking about what your customers 
feel and ask about that subject while speaking to you, the real estate professional? It's always a question I get, right? It's, it's, you know, all right, we're ready to make an offer or we're getting ready to, to start shopping around. Um, and I always get the question, should I take fixed? Should I take variable? <laughs> so my first, uh, you know, my first, <laughs> first thing that I want to make sure clients are aware is that I'm not, not a real, I'm not a, a mortgage broker, right? So I, I deal in real estate, although I do have a knowledge on, you know, um, the idea of them. I don't know the, hundred thousand different products that there are in the different institutions offering them. So I think it's important for people to speak with a mortgage broker or to speak with someone who, you know, a, a relative that has purchased many properties or sold many properties uh, to get an idea that what would be best for them. Right. Uh, when it comes to the second portion of that answer, it would be, you know, for me, uh, my particular situation, having a family, um, you know, I'm, I'm someone who likes to know exactly how much I'm spending every month, exactly how much I'm, I'm, you know, uh, saving and whatnot. So it's important for me to know how much I'm going to be paying for the next three, four or five years and not be unaware of, uh, if it's going to go, if my prices for my mortgage are going to go up or if it's going to go down. So personally, <laughs> I like, I like the stability. So for me, fixed rate paying a little bit more is, is something that's important um, but that's very personal to to me, right? What about you? I, I know I know we spoke about this a little bit, and and I know we have you know different views personally. But uh, I'd love to hear about an expert's <laughs> advice. For, for sure. Um, so I, I'll start by saying I'm, I'm biased, and full disclosure, I've only ever had a variable rate mortgage throughout, throughout my life. But I do have kind of a unique life that, in my opinion, justifies the variable the variable rate for me. Um, in fact, before I actually tell you how I feel about it in, in general, I would like to share a little bit about what our users have been doing, our users at visiting Nesto.ca for, for information and also coming through for the, for the whole mortgage process. Um, and the numbers are pretty big. So between May and today, there's always been about 75% of people landing at Nesto inquiring about the variable. And one can say, well, it's a lower rate, it attracts the eyes, they click on it first. So that, that could be the case, but 75% of our users back in May and also today, start off wanting to talk to us about the variable rate. Um, in May, at the end of the process, 83% of our users have actually chosen to opt for a variable rate at that moment in time. They may change their mind after that initial submission, but the submission was, was a variable. The number dropped by 13% for June, so we had 70% choose variable in June. And keep in mind, the intent at the beginning was always about 75% I want a variable rate. Uh, today, which would be a mix of our July numbers and our, and our August numbers, we've got 60% actually choosing the variable. So the, the interest is there. The, the visual cue of that rate is so low, I want to talk about it, it's still there. Um, but after discussing with a mortgage professional, which would probably include what the next five years of their life looks like, less and less are opting for that variable rate. Um, and the quickest way to, 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 to hack through this question is the variable rate has a tiny break penalty. So it's very forgiving if something happens in your life that causes you to either break your mortgage. That's the, the, the quick, cheap answer. But the better answer would be when you choose, when, you, when you're left with the decision to choose between a fixed or a variable, um, there's a too many things to consider. The internet's a great resource, but the internet doesn't know you. The person, professional, who's supposed to know you and, and be prompted to ask questions about you based on what you're sharing to help them form a picture of what's most suitable. So if you are opting for a fixed rate, and this is my opinion, I think you're making three bets. You're betting that um, you're not gonna sell the property in the five years. You're also betting that you're either not gonna need money from the property, or if you do need money, you're gonna get it from somewhere else without an issue. Um, and the third bet you're making is that you, you don't wanna, you're not gonna wanna early renew, so that you don't believe the interest rates are gonna be significantly lower before your five years are up. When you are opting for a variable, the bet you're making is that the Bank of Canada will not increase the prime rate to the point that you've now paid more interest on the variable than you have on the fixed. So in simple terms, those are the three bets. Now, the benefit of the fixed rate that we didn't talk about in the bets is you have a static payment. You know exactly what to expect. The benefit of the variable rate, excluding the bet, is it's a very small break penalty. A variable rate penalty is, uh, the quick math is about 1.5 times your monthly payment. If you look Great, the penalty could be anywhere from 1% of the loan balance up to three and a half, four 4%, depending on the lender. And depending right. on the rates of the day you break the mortgage are versus the mortgage rate that you have. So after all those bets are, are, are said and done, um, 
I, I think that when the variable rate is 1% or more lower than the fixed rate, it's really hard to justify taking the fixed rate. The, the, right. the payment difference is massive and you need to make a candidate to truly work against you mm-hmm. month over month over month to where the interest exposure, it, you're, you're at a loss. Right. Today, so our best fixed rate today at Nesto for a full future mortgage is 439. Our best variable is 3.6. So the spread is much smaller than it was over the past three years, for example. On a $400,000 mortgage, it's $165 a month on the difference there. So if you have a variable rate mortgage today, two Bank of Canada moves upward, might make you regret your decision because you'll be paying more interest assuming it doesn't come back down. And all that you're left as a benefit is I can break my mortgage very cheaply. Mm-hmm. So if the odds of moving or if the odds of needing money are, are, are very low, me, historically the variable, I'm going to be taking a fixed rate. Mm-hmm. If the odds of moving um, exceed 10% or the odds of relocating, um, I, I I would probably stick with the variable and pay that higher interest cost for the freedom to exit cheaply. And I'm I'm different than yourself. You've got kids and a family and you're in your home. I work between Ottawa and Montreal. I still travel. I have no kids. So I am very comfortable with the variable rate mortgage because I love that freedom. I don't want the mortgage penalty to dictate a life decision of mine at this stage of my life. Um, But that's a, a unique perspective from someone like me. Most people my age have families at this time. So I, I, I do really appreciate the, the, your respect for that secured payment. You know what it is for five years. You can budget accordingly. You can plan it. Exactly. But, yeah. The we awesome. Can little secret <laughs> that banks don't talk about, but that I like to talk about. And I know we talked about this before, but um, uh, and I don't think there's anything about, you know, I, everybody has an opinion on this, and, but I think it's very personal choosing a variable versus, you know, a fixed. Mm-hmm super personal. It depends on so many variables. Um, one thing I, I, I wanted to touch on, and maybe you can explain this a little bit more because I know about it, uh, but I, I'm, I'm not, I don't know everything about it. And I think it'd be kind of interesting to speak to, to everybody about this, but portability. Ah. Ah. <laughs> Great one. You have a fixed rate, right? Um, and of course, fixed rate, you can do two, three, five years, right? So um, but let's say you do a five years fixed rate, um, because I've done that before. And then I wanted to port my mortgage to my, my new home. So I want to keep my current interest rate and my current mortgage. And I want to buy a house that's potentially a bit more expensive. Uh, and so create a second, you know, a second, um, a second portion basically, mm-hmm. uh, rates, but I would keep the majority of it as the lower rate. Can you explain that to me a little bit more? Yeah, I'll start off by saying it's, it's extremely complicated for you. <laughs> we all use the same word, portability, portable feature, can I port? Um, but depending on the institution who owns your mortgage, the word means something else. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'll start with the big banks. The big banks, on average, will allow a port window of 120 days, meaning if you sell your property on day one, as long as you buy your new property by day two, you can transfer the mortgage over. Now, depending on the product at the bank, and also depending on the bank, that, that, that window, well, that window exists, there's stipulations within. Um, so an example would be some lenders may not let you increase your mortgage. You have to add a second part of your mortgage at the new rate. Mm-hmm. Other than offer what's called a blend and extend. Mm-hmm. Other lenders or products are a lot more strict and there's no new money being allowed to be added. So if you have a $200,000 balance on your house that you just sold, you're only allowed to carry that $200,000 mortgage to the new property, meaning the difference between the price and your mortgage is going to be your required down payment and not everyone has the funds to satisfy that and they have to break the mortgage but the the, the option of portability is, is extremely underutilized and an extremely important one because it takes away the fear out of the fixed rate yeah. it, it's the only mechanism that would exist to save you from um, a large a, a large prepayment penalty and i won't talk about prepayment penalties very much but i will say when your mortgage rate is higher than the best rate in the market or the market rate you can expect your fixed rate penalty to be very, very, very large. When your mortgage rate is smaller than the market rate, you can expect your fixed rate penalty to not be that large. The bank wants that money back. They want to lend it out again. Whereas, in the first example, they don't want the money back because they got to lend it out again for cheaper. Yeah. So portability, the feature itself is the only way around that prepared penalty. And it doesn't always let, it doesn't always work. So like I give you those examples before, depending on what portable feature exists in your mortgage is one thing. And then the other things where they could kind of pop your tire in that process is 
the property that you bought with the mortgage that you were qualified for, the decision that went into giving you that mortgage included the property. Right. And now you want to port the mortgage to a new property. So the, the decision actually has to come back. And let's say you, you want to put the mortgage from your condo in downtown Montreal to your cottage in Ottawa. Right. Well, if the cottage is on a well and septic, the bank has, they have discretion here to say, that's not the same mortgage. We, we, don't, we don't want to do this. And that's why portability is, under, is not talked about enough. Uh, and there's so much uncertainty and the power is not predictable. The power is in the bank's hands. So if I'm getting a mortgage um, and I'm getting a fixed rate, I'm definitely focusing on the portability feature and I'm asking the questions about it. And I probably even seek to have the responses sent to me in writing, just in case that person is not there by the time I need to use the feature. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think you mentioned, you know, it's, it's, it's good when you mention uncertainty about the product, right? I, even when I called for my own personal mortgage because I wanted to cancel and I wanted to buy another property and I was before the end of my term, um, you know, they, nobody told me, yeah, of course you can cancel. Here's your fee. Like, thank you very much. You can pay that. <laughs> nobody told me I had a second option, which was actually offered to me um, when I mentioned it. And I said, well, what about portability? Like, could I keep this mortgage and just add a, a little bit extra or just have a second mortgage for my other property? And the first thing they told me was like, oh, it's going to be more expensive at the notary. But for us, that's a lawyer, right? Sure. Yeah. Well, hundred bucks. <laughs> it's not ten thousand dollars, right? Like, um, just... so uh, I think asking a lot of questions to see if that's an option for you, and if you don't ask a question, you won't know. Um, that's mm -hmm. something to buy, right? It's it's really important to 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 know your options, and most most institutions won't. And I think you know we talked a little bit about this, but some some representatives actually don't know what portability is, right? Yeah. Because it's a complicated pro it's a complicated product product um they won't necessarily be aware of it so making sure you press to talk to someone who actually knows about it and mm -hmm. is able to tell you if you're eligible and if you can actually do it and what are your criteria is, is really important that's certainly i, I would make a, a mental note that if, if my mortgage professional does not talk to me about the prepayment penalty if i break the mortgage or the options of, of according the mortgage um that's a red flag. This should be easy to talk about, especially when you're proud of the product that, 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 that you're offering. Uh, one small piece to add to the portability uh, subject is assumability. It's less common, uh, much less common, but it's, it's very similar. Instead of porting your mortgage, you're actually, when, when you use that feature, you allow the buyer to assume your mortgage. Now, they still have to qualify the same way you did, um, but if you have an interest rate of you know, two, three, nine, five year fixed rate now, when the market rates are up in the fours, that may be what's needed to sell your house for the price you want compared to the neighbors who are also selling. So the assumability is also interesting. Um, <laughs> it's funny but, because it's actually going to be, I can see this happening where people are going to be buying a house, sure, but the, they're also going to be buying potentially a, a mortgage, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Like they're going to start selling their houses with their 2.9% rate, which we're not going to see anymore. And that's going to give them the advantage versus the neighbor who's selling who doesn't? No, exactly. Great point. Um, just for anyone listening, if you have questions, feel free to type them in. We will have time in a few moments to, to do Q&A, so don't be shy, please. Um, I do not <laughs> Ready. Because I, I mean, I, I know there's a lot of people talking about, you know, affordability and, and um, you know, if the interest rates are going to be at five point, you know, whatever percent, which they actually are now uh, at a higher around five percent and over. So that's right. Yeah, still. yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> I get this, point, this question a lot where, well, don't you think people are going to have to sell their homes because the rates are now over five percent and they got approved for one point, whatever, two percent. Uh, but there's a, a really important process when you do an application that includes a stress test correct yeah exactly mm -hmm. right the stress test there's a, a minimum percentage that or you're you need to be able to qualify for and it's gonna what what is that percentage of interest that the banks go for i'm really happy you brought it up i, would, I wouldn't have thought of this but the stress test is actually um it, it's it's going to become a bigger subject soon because of the discrepancy that now exists due to the way the rates have moved and so quickly right. So normally to get a, a five-year fixed mortgage, fixed or variable, your, the stress test is applied. And what the stress test is, if it's a fixed rate, 
or it's just always supposed to be the contract rate that you're applying for plus two percent or the bank of canada qualifying rate which is five and a quarter whichever yeah. one higher is a stress test rate for the past three or four months any fixed rate available plus two percent was much higher than the bank of canada qualifying rate right so you'd be using the contract plus two qualifying for less money than you would have thought in the old ways but then when you're getting a variable rate the, the contract rate is much, much lower. So it's contract rate plus two or Bank of Canada. Historically, the past three months, four months, the Bank of Canada rate was the higher of the two. So if you offer a variable rate mortgage, and I think this might, might cause problems that we don't know about yet. If you were opting for a variable rate mortgage, you were qualifying for quite a bit more money in mortgage right. finance than if you were applying for a fixed rate. Mm -hmm. That's something that's being ironed out now, and it's a hot topic. You'll read about the Globe and Mail and CMHC. Right. Um, and they don't have a, final figures yet as to what, what that did, but we'll bring those support as soon as we do. But if you put that aside, what the stress test did for, for these consumers was a positive. It made sure that we apply our extremely strict lending rules and, and, and debt service ratio criteria on a fictitious rate that is substantially higher than the rate you're actually paying. So if your mortgage payment is $1,000 a month, we actually qualified you probably somewhere between thirteen and $1,400 a month. And right. it's, it does not mean that it, we expect you to easily to be able to afford that payment. It, it, it means that we created a buffer based on the mortgage rules. So everyone who's going to be experiencing these increased payments, whether, whether the variable has gone up during the term or the new fixture term is coming due when they need, a higher, uh, they need to renew for a higher rate, we're all going to feel a cash flow. Of course. I don't think there's any way around that. But it's, what's really important is that your ability to get another mortgage and refinance it and fix your cash flow externally from your mortgage, but by including it in your mortgage, was protected because of the way the stress test was built. And when it first came to play, there was a lot of opponents against the stress test. Um, like I love having a stress test for purchases. I think it's a no-brainer. I think we'd make, yeah. make it a little bit stronger if we needed to. But yeah. the one place the stress test people deemed was felt it was inappropriate was on a mortgage renewal. And why that was deemed inappropriate is because if you stay with your existing lender, there's no stress test. But if you want to leave to a new lender, you get stress tested. So the existing lender could take advantage of a borrower in that case and offer a higher rate knowing they were kind of married to them. Um, so that, if you hear arguments against the stress test, it was in that renewal category, whereas I believe that one of the industry really supports a stress test on purchases. They like, like, like go tomorrow. Great question. Awesome. I love it. I know a few uh, people asked some questions here. Uh, I don't know if you want to yeah. maybe. Think... Yeah, we can go. Does do want any good questions there? Oh, um, I don't know how to pull up my screen. Yeah. So the question is, can you talk a bit about how you can approach renewals when you have an undivided condo and thus have much less choice? That's a hard one. That's a very hard one. You're not going to like my answer. <laughs> there's a better answer out there. Um, being from Ontario myself, I have less experience in, in that department, but I have investigated it quite a bit uh, with Nesto in Quebec. The best lenders that exist in Quebec for your underwriter property is going to be Desjardins and National Bank. And there's a really good chance one of them is your mortgage company today. I would suggest you talk to your neighbors, find out if they have the same mortgage company as you, um, and work together. So if you are all with Desjardins, Desjardins doesn't have much incentive to, to, to give you out of your four neighbors or five neighbors a great rate. But if Desjardins knows that you and your neighbors are collaborative and you're speaking with National Bank and Desjardins, there's a lot less chance that they're going to waste your time. I would start this process at least 120 days before the renewal date. Um, and I, and I, I really wish there was more lenders for you out there in the prime space. National Bank and Desjardins will be the ones who can give you the best rate on that, on that property. Uh, I wish I had a better answer. I wish I had more of an answer for you. And I hope that Nesto one day can, can service those mortgages for you as well, because I do see it underserved and it's not necessarily fair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 100%. Any easier questions, Des? <laughs> one more question. What do you think will happen next rate announcement coming up? What do I think will happen next rate announcement coming up? So that date is set for September 7th. And it's, it's really interesting because the Bank of Canada tells us they need to increase the interest rates to solve our infl runaway inflation. And then we get great inflation numbers, I shouldn't say great, much better inflation numbers coming in for July. And immediately after, the Bank of Canada tweeted, our target is 2%. We're going to keep doing things until we get to 2%. The Bank of Canada didn't have to tweet that. It was a negative tweet, but they did so on purpose 
to make sure no one got false hope or optimism from those inflation numbers. So before that tweet came out, I was anticipating in my, in my head a 0.5% increase. As soon as I saw that tweet, I, I started bracing for a 075 to 1% increase. I would expect us to close the year and this is pure ballpark guessing based on the sentiment that I, that I feel from Bank of Canada and being on the ground seeing um, you know, inflation in real time in, in my own life, in my, 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 my network's life, I, I think we'll probably see the prime rate go up another 1.5%. And again, that is a, I'm not an economist, that is speculation, but 0 0.5, 0 0.75, September 7th, and then one more after that, and then we'll see what happens. This does not mean I, I, I'm scared of the variable rate, but it does mean that unless I really, really, really need that prepayment flexibility of a small penalty, the variable is a little bit scary because even though it's $165 a month less today for a $400,000 mortgage, two more increases to prime is going to erase that interest rate savings for me. And then I have to hope that the bank account will come back down before my five-year term is up to make sure that I'm ahead interest-wise. Yeah. And I think for, for real estate, you know, having... Uh, again, like it, it was there to cool down the market. So it's going to help maybe keep the houses at a price where, um, you know, it's going to be a bit more affordable. But at the, at, again, prices, uh, people are going to be able to afford a little less as well, right? So it's it's all it's all a balance game. And, and so, um, you know, I think around the bigger cities, we're still, we're going to see a slowdown like we still are. Um, mm -hmm. And people need to worry about houses, you know, the housing market crash. <laughs> like it would probably somewhere where it'd be in the middle of nowhere. Um, so I think we're safe in that regards. I, I agree. I like that. I, I can't imagine a crash coming our way. If you look at our immigration targets, look at our shortage of housing supply. Um, it's, it's just an untrue statement uh, based on all my feelings and, and what I see when, when I hear it. I'm not opposed to or I'm, I'm not arguing that we won't see a uh, reduction in price or correction by any means, but I, I don't think anyone's real estate um, empire is at, is at risk or the, the, the retirement through real estate is at risk by any means. No, I mean, even looking at three years ago uh, before COVID, and I, I mentioned this to my clients that when they, when they asked me the same question, <laughs> uh, is it because of COVID that all these prices have been going up? And um, my answer is, is always no. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, I think it that... Helped. Pardon? It didn't help, but it's not the reason. <laughs> I think it definitely it definitely pushed things forwards and probably made it happen a little quicker. Um, but you know, a, a full year in Gatineau before COVID, um, we saw our first increase in 30 years. That was 14 percent. This is a full year before COVID, so that wasn't even the thing we're even thinking about a global pandemic. Um, and so we increased in 14 percent. And it was the first year that we had more people moving into Gatineau than moving out. So a positive migration here. Uh, and so to me, that means something, right? It means that people were already moving here. Um, you know, people are getting maybe a little bit more in the suburbs of the bigger cities because they want to buy a property. And so uh, they're looking a little bit outside of there. Um, and I think in Ottawa, correct me if I'm wrong, but in Ottawa, we've also seen even a few years prior to COVID, um, you know, the, the real estate market being where yeah. we would higher increases. Uh, in Gatineau, we saw an increase of 25%, 24 to 26% for two years straight, right? Yeah. Uh, that, <laughs> so I go really doubt it's going to go back to what it was prior to. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I, I'm, not, I'm not worried about that. I'm going back in time in my mind, and I, I remember seeing Vancouver, I think this was probably around 2014, 2015, but I, I saw it was happening in Vancouver, I saw it was happening in Toronto, um, and I, I saw the, the modest average home buyer get priced out of the market unless there was existing equity or family support, and in my mind, the next best place is, and I'm biased, to live Montreal and Ottawa. So I, I, really, I really believe that we were able to feed off of those booms a little bit prior to COVID as well. Um, we've got 15, just under 15 minutes. If you have any questions, please do just write them here and we'll get to them. Uh, and if you don't have questions, the last thing I want to talk about, I guess, is just to close out on um, what, I, what I believe that the, the, the next 12 months of buying a home might look like or feel like, and, 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 and have Catherine ch challenge me on it, and maybe we'll even agree. So I was in the home buying process during COVID. I got out of the home buying process. It, it, it was too uncomfortable for me. Um, but seeing the listings come up for sale now, seeing the, the amount of days there are in market, seeing the amount of buyers who are able to put conditions in there, I'm personally excited to get back into the home buying market. And 
I'm not necessarily marrying my decision on when I want to get into the market based on the Bank of Canada. For me, it, it it's going to come to the value. If I see something that I love and I can picture myself living in for the next five years, I'll probably pull the trigger regardless of Bank of Canada because it's shelter. We need shelter. And that's my own, my own sentiment. Do you think I'm, I'm, I'm unique in this or do you think I share the same feelings as most borrowers today? Um, I'm seeing a lot of people feeling that way. Uh, I'm, I, I mean, there's always people that are a bit more risk averse and are, I think are going to take a little bit more time in getting back into the market just because of what we've seen and, and maybe being a little bit traumatized by their experience. Um, but I think that, you know, anytime I have a client approach me, they're feeling a bit more calm about the process. Right. Um, and so Buying a home has always been, you know, a, a, a long-term thing because you're buying your first home, but when you buy your first home, you're not paying rent. So you're not mm -hmm. paying mortgage. Um, and then you're also building equity to purchase the next property, whether you're downsizing, upsizing, you're right-sizing, right? So you're, you're going to go to another property most likely. Uh, the average person in the U.S. stays in their home for 13 years, and in Canada, it's about seven, right? So we're moving a little bit more. Yeah, seven years in their home. That's so interesting. Yeah. It's a long time, but I think that's going to start decreasing a lot too with people being able to work remotely. We're seeing a lot of, of, uh, of people wanting to, to move even overseas and to, to travel a lot more. So I'm sure that's going to change. Yeah. Um, but uh, for sure, I mean, I'm seeing more people wanting to, to purchase homes and being a little bit more comfortable about the process, right? This may even sound off topic, and I apologize. As soon as you said Canadians are spending, you know, on average seven years in their home, my mind went right to five-year fixed-rate mortgages. Yeah. You, get a mortgage, you renew for another five-year fixed rate. Two years later, the average Canadian is now selling that home. So, you know, if if you do hit your five-year mark on a fixed rate, think of how long you're going to spend in that home. And if the answer is not five more years for sure, you need to be asking the questions about fixed right. or variable in mind Wait. for sure. Yeah, exactly. You want to find a product that suits your needs. So people might sometimes do, I'm guessing, you know, fixed rate. And then the next time they'll do variable rate and it'll move around um, through their lifespan, right? It'll change. Um, so that's why I think it's very, very personal question. I don't think someone can, uh, can, can argue with another person about, you know, their rate because at the end, of the day, they don't know what variables that this person is going through or what their life looks like. Right. Um, it's it's very much a personal uh, a personal choice. Personal choice, difficult choice, intimidating choice, and it's so important to, to get feedback. Someone from yeah. a professional can tell you all the advice that they, they know based on what you've given them. Yeah. Bring bring that to a family member who who knows you, who will challenge you, who who can make sure you're honest with yourself as well. It's important to get perspective. Yeah. Um, we're out of time, Catherine, but this was very 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 oh. fun definitely do it again we'll spend a lot more time talking about credit because i think that'd be uh we could have went deeper on that for sure but 100%. Thank thanks for coming thanks for joining us sorry about the tech difficulties at the beginning uh, that's on that's on me and nesto here <laughs> thank you so much everybody tuning in thank you have a lovely lovely wednesday see everybody thanks. Bye, my goodness